Hello everyone, welcome to Ordinary People Stories. If you're interested, please like my video and subscribe to my channel. On Christmas Day, my brother proposed to the girl who used to bully me at school. My mom warmly welcomed her and made a lot of delicious food. What she didn't know was that the elegant future daughter-in-law in front of her was the same person who had driven her daughter to write a suicide note. On Christmas Day, my brother brought his girlfriend home and proposed to her in front of our parents. My mom was very pleased with my brother's girlfriend. She was a teacher, eloquent, and her clever words often made my mom laugh heartily. But my mom didn't know that this same mouth had once spat into my food and forced me to swallow it. This person had once dragged me into the bathroom, torn off my clothes, and filmed a video. She had poured red ink on my school uniform and smeared glue in my hair. She even sold me to some local thugs. I will never forget her, Katong. The moment I saw her, dead memories revived like a flood, my blood froze and my body trembled uncontrollably. Katong seemed not to recognize me. Before dinner, she warmly took my hand and said sweetly, This must be the little sister. I brought you a gift. I hope you like it. Then she whispered in my ear, Make sure to open it tonight. Every moment she was close to me, every pore on my body resisted. I naturally stepped back, widening the distance between us. Thank you, I'm Wen Chi. I carefully observed her eyes, hoping to catch a glimpse of fear. But there was none. She seemed to be hearing this name for the first time, her eyes full of smiles. But even if she didn't remember me, my brother surely would. During those years when our parents were working away, it was just my brother and me at home. It was my brother who saved me from a failed suicide attempt. It was my brother who accompanied me to psychological therapy. Has he forgotten? Has he forgotten this person? Has he forgotten the suicide note I left behind? I looked at my brother, but he seemed to avoid my gaze intentionally, which made me more certain that he remembered. He remembered that this woman bullied me, but he still fell in love with her and proposed to her. I felt very uneasy during the meal. My mom kept giving me food and said, Chi Chi, you should hurry and find a boyfriend too. Then your dad and I won't have to worry anymore. Before I could speak, Katong immediately chimed in. I don't know what kind of person little sister likes. I'll keep an eye out and introduce someone suitable. I ignored her. My dad seemed to notice my discomfort and looked disapprovingly at my mom. Chi Chi is still young. I don't want to hand her over to some foolish guy. I'll take care of her for the rest of my life. Normally, my dad was afraid of my mom. Even if she threw his pillow out of the room at night, he wouldn't dare to complain. He would just pick up the pillow and go squeeze in with the family's golden retriever. The atmosphere turned cold. After dinner, Ke Tong eagerly went to wash the dishes. My mom took the opportunity to pull me into the room. Chi Chi, you don't look well. Are you sick? Don't mind what I said earlier. I didn't mean to rush you. Your dad and I can't bear to see you get married and leave. It was just a casual remark. My mom thought I was upset because of her words and started explaining. I kept my head down, picking at my thumb until I had peeled off a piece of skin. My mom finally realized the seriousness and grabbed my hand, calling out in concern. Chi Chi, Chi Chi, what's wrong? Don't scare mom. After a long while, I finally looked up, my eyes filled with fear as I met my mom's eyes. Mom, can you, can you, not agree to my brother's marriage? Now my mom didn't care what kind of request I was making. She immediately answered. Okay, okay, mom will agree to anything you say. Just don't hurt yourself. Because my parents were often away on business, my brother and I grew up with our grandfather, so I was never close to them. It wasn't until middle school, when I was bullied by Katong and left a suicide note, that they rushed back. Since then, they've stayed by my side. They felt it was their busy work life that caused me harm, so they've always felt guilty. So my parents have tried to satisfy me in many ways, 
trying to close the gap between us and make up for my lost childhood. Katong's father was powerful and wealthy. When the incident happened, he immediately sent her abroad to study and changed her name, so my parents had never met her. Oh, wait, now she's called Kajiajia. But my brother has met her. Why would he do this? He knows how much Kajiajia hurt me, and he has always protected me. Now he wants to marry the person who bullied me. How ironic. I suddenly remembered the gift Kajiajia gave me. Trembling, I opened it. It was a shirt, but not just any shirt. It was exactly like the one that was torn apart back then. Exactly the same. Even though so many years have passed and this style is very old now. Kajiajia still went to great lengths to find it and gave it to me. She hasn't forgotten me at all. She knew who I was even before we met. She gave this gift to remind me of what happened back then. Suddenly, it felt like something was stuck in my chest, and I couldn't breathe. I was about to faint. My mom cried out and held me, pinching the web between my thumb and index finger while calling out for my dad and brother. Dad rushed over first, followed by my brother, and finally Kajajia. She hid behind my brother, clutching his shirt fearfully. Gathering all my strength, I asked her why she wouldn't leave me alone. With a tearful expression, she said I just wanted to apologize to Chi Chi. I was immature back then. I hadn't expected her to openly admit her identity, but now I understood why she was so confident. My brother shielded Ke Jia Jia, saying it's been so many years. Do you want Jia Jia to die? Even criminals get a chance to correct their mistakes. Why can't Jia Jia have a chance? Angrily, he added, Wen Shuo, you better know what you're doing, before storming off with Kajiajia in tow. Dad carried me outside, glaring at my brother, Wen Shuo, you better know what you're doing. I ended up in the hospital again. I had spent ten years moving past the trauma, but Kajiajia dragged me back to that nightmare in less than a day. My parents didn't dare ask me anything, afraid of triggering me. I was numb, tears flowing without emotion. I could never forgive Kajiajia, ever. I suffered from PTSD, a condition that remains lifelong for a third of the people affected. I once thought I was lucky because, with my brother and parents' support, I had gradually forgotten those memories. But it was too painful. The memories were too painful. In the small southern town, middle schools required boarding, and I was unfortunately assigned to the same dormitory as Kadyatya. No, back then she was Katong. On the first day in the dorm, she made me fetch ash with my hands as a show of dominance. At that time, I had no idea how terrifying school bullying could be, so I ignored her. Damn, you dumb newbie, can't you hear me? She shouted louder. I turned around and looked at her seriously, I'm not dumb. My name is Wen Chi. Katong was furious, what's with that look? Are you glaring at me? Bring her over here. Before I could react, two girls dragged me over. One chubby girl kicked my knees, demanding I apologize. Pinned down, I couldn't stand up, but I didn't apologize because I hadn't done anything wrong. Katong took the last drag of her cigarette and blew the smoke into my face. That was my first time smelling smoke. It was choking and unpleasant. Oh, a stubborn one, huh? Let's see how stubborn you are. She pressed the cigarette butt into my arm. The pain was unbearable. I cried out and she slapped me, crying like you're at a funeral? Will you ignore me next time I call you? Fortunately, a lookout ran in, whispering, Tong Jie, the dorm supervisor is coming. Katong ordered the girls to release me, then kicked my knee when I couldn't stand. Damn it, get up. I lost my balance and fell. The dorm supervisor pushed the door open, shining a flashlight on me, sternly asking, what's going on? Katong pretended to help me up while pinching my thigh where the supervisor couldn't see. Tell on me and I'll make your life hell. She pulled me up, smiling at the supervisor, nothing, she slipped because the floor was wet. Right? The other girls chimed in, yeah, I just mopped the floor. Right, she fell by herself. 
the supervisor looked at me disdainfully, All right, stop crying. You're not a child anymore. Falling and crying, really? She shut the door behind her. I cried not just because of the pain, but out of fear. I had always been shy and my brother protected me well, so I'd never been hurt like this. When I was a freshman in high school, my brother was a senior, so at least we were in the same school. Now I was a sophomore, and my brother was in college. I didn't know what to do with my grievances except to wait for the weekend. That night, Katong didn't torment me further. I managed to sleep, but I had nightmares. The next day in class, many students were new to me since we had just been reassigned. Katong was outgoing and attractive, quickly making friends with the boys. She sat behind me, and any sound from that direction made my heart race with fear. During lunch, I went to the class advisor to request a dorm change, but Katong saw me. The advisor asked why I wanted to switch dorms. Before I could speak, Katong walked in, laughing and wrapping her arm around mine, Hi, teacher. I came to see Wen Chi. The advisor seemed to favor outgoing students and smiled warmly at her. Katong, perfect timing. Wen Chi wants to switch dorms. Do you know why? I was terrified that Katong might think I had told the advisor something and retaliate against me. Really? You want to change dorms? Don't. It's okay, teacher. Wen Chi just feels lonely. I'll take care of her from now on. The class advisor nodded, all right, unless it's something major, don't change dorms. Your primary role right now is as a student, focus on your studies instead of making friends all the time. I nodded and said, okay. Then Katong pulled me away. Later, I found out that even if I had told the advisor about Katong bullying me, nothing would have happened. Because Katong's father was a prominent businessman in our town, he had a lot of influence. When Katong was assigned to our class, her father had already spoken to the advisor. The advisor wouldn't dare to offend him. Katong didn't say anything on the way back to the dorm, just dragged me along. Weakly, I said I didn't tell the teacher. Shut up, Katong glared at me fiercely. Back in the dorm, Katong pressed me against the wall and slapped me, Damn it, little bitch, you dare to tell on us? The burning pain on my face made tears stream down, I didn't. But Ka Tong didn't care what I said. After she got tired of hitting me, she pushed me to the ground. The floor was wet, and my black and white school uniform was covered in stains. Ka Tong rolled up her sleeves, took a cigarette one of the other girls handed her, smoked, and used her shoe to crush my fingers. Why did you go tell him to change dorms? Just because you wanted to say we bullied you? Let me tell you, even if you go to the teacher or the principal, it won't matter. Do you know who my dad is? For the first time, despair was so close to me, my mind went blank. Katong's words echoed in my ears, and I fell into a state of numbness. I couldn't hear my own crying or any other sound around me. I choked and convulsed, the pain in my body turning into numbness. The girl closest to me noticed something was wrong and quickly said to Katong, Jie, should we stop? She seems to be having trouble breathing. What if something happens? I didn't know when Katong moved her foot from my hand. At that moment, I lost all hearing and sensation, even briefly losing consciousness. The girl in the bunk below mine dragged me against the wall and checked my eyelids. She lifted my head and said, Jie, it seems like she's in shock. The other girls in the dorm started to panic. Though they bullied people, they had never encountered a situation like this before. One by one, they looked at Katong. Katong's eyes flashed with panic, and she quickly blinked. What are you afraid of? At most, she's just scared silly. She won't die. If you don't tell anyone, who will know what scared her? Don't worry, if something happens, I'll take the blame. Comforted by Katong's words, the others stopped talking and followed her out of the dorm to the cafeteria. The girl named Xiao Dan helped me drink some water. I gradually regained consciousness, trembling all over but still powerless. Xiao Dan tried to lift me twice but couldn't. 
In the end, she just let me continue leaning against the wall. After more than half an hour, I finally had some strength. I got up shakily and changed out of my wet uniform. I didn't dare to leave the dorm, afraid of running into them. So I put the dirty clothes in a basin, planning to wash them after evening self-study. Lying on the bed, I remembered everything Katong had done to me these past few days. Tears silently flowed, wetting the pillow. I couldn't close my eyes, afraid that I would see them slapping me again. I didn't understand what I had done wrong. Was it because I didn't pick up the ash on the first day we met, or because I didn't apologize to her? Maybe it was my reaction that scared them. For a while after that incident, they didn't trouble me, but they would make fun of me during breaks, in front of other boys. They said I was a coward, that I wet my pants from fear. Those harsh words echoed in my ears, and I didn't dare to cover them. I just kept my head down. Someone threw something at the back of my head, and I almost cried out in fear, but I didn't dare to turn around to see who did it. I just cautiously glanced at the ground, seeing it was a ball of paper. There was loud laughter from the boys behind me, followed by footsteps. I closed my eyes in fear. Sorry, I didn't mean to hit you just now. My bad, my bad. A boy's voice came from behind me. Luckily, it wasn't Katong. I slowly opened my eyes and quietly said, it's okay. But he didn't leave. Instead, he went to sit in the empty seat in front of me, leaning on the desk and looking at me. Hey, don't cry. I didn't mean it. I lifted my head slightly and recognized him, the notorious troublemaker in our sophomore class, Zhuo Yao. I quickly wiped my eyes with my hand, but there were no tears, just a slight stinging sensation around my eyes. Hey, Zhuo Yao, why are you apologizing to her? Do you like her? Katong shouted from behind. Now the whole class heard and started to jeer. Zhuo Yao stood up, picked up the paper ball from under my feet, what are you talking about? If you didn't throw paper balls at me, I wouldn't have accidentally hit her. Katong and Zhuo Yao got along well and often teamed up. So at that time, I thought Zhuo Yao was deliberately making fun of me. After all, liking me was a joke back then. The boys in class always said during their bets, whoever loses becomes Wen Qi's boyfriend. No one wanted to lose face by being associated with me in any way. But at least I didn't have to endure beatings anymore, I didn't care. My brother didn't come home on the weekend. He called to say he was working part-time and asked me to listen to grandpa and grandma at home. I was disappointed but still agreed. I didn't know how to tell him that I was being bullied, didn't know how to open up about it, I was afraid I would break down the next second. Katong stopped bullying me because they had a new target, Xiaodan. Xiaodan was dark-skinned, a bit chubby, not very tall, and spoke with an accent from another province. I heard she used to study in another province, but her mom couldn't stand her dad's beatings anymore, so she brought her back. These were all things I heard from the old folks in town, so we younger ones all knew. That day, when we returned to the dormitory after evening self-study, I couldn't push open the dormitory door no matter how hard I tried. There were faint cries coming from inside, as well as the sound of iron beds scraping on the floor. I knew someone had been beaten up by Katong again, and the fear in my heart was awakened again, so I dared not knock on the door, crouching against the wall in the corridor. The dormitory attendant shone her flashlight at me, asking why I hadn't returned to the dormitory to sleep. I didn't say anything, and immediately stood up to prepare to return to the dormitory. But before I could, the dormitory attendant walked over and pushed our dormitory door. Seeing it wouldn't open, she raised her foot and kicked it hard. The sound of the iron door echoed in the empty corridor, and other students in the dormitory opened their doors and poked their heads out to look. Room 411, open up. The dormitory attendant shouted loudly. The door of our dormitory opened slowly, and the dormitory attendant walked in, asking what they were doing. I followed in only to realize later how foolish this move was. From the moment I entered, Katong's eyes had been staring at me. I didn't understand how I had annoyed her again, 
so I pretended not to see her gaze and comforted myself that I must have been mistaken. Xiao Dan was still sitting on the ground crying, her school uniform jacket pulled to one side, and clear nail marks on her arms. The dormitory attendant looked at her and said, Slipped again, huh? Stop crying, isn't it embarrassing? Crying when you're in high school. I widened my eyes, feeling like I must have misheard, or maybe I was blind. The dormitory floor was cement, so if she slipped on water from mopping, it would barely pass, but the floor was dry now, how could she have slipped? I didn't believe she hadn't seen Xiaodan's state, but she chose to ignore it. Before leaving, I saw her exchange a glance with Ketong. The dormitory door was closed again with a bang. I helped Xiao Dan up and helped her put on her school uniform. As the fabric brushed against the bruises on her arms, she winced in pain, but only made small grunts. After the lights were out, I climbed onto my bed, feeling a vague sense of unease. Suddenly, a hand reached in from above the guardrail, tightly gripping my arm. I was startled and sat up with a jolt. The cold moonlight streamed in from outside, and I saw it was Katong. Wen Chi, come with me to the restroom. Uh, okay. I tried to pull my hand away, but Katong pulled hard, pulling me off the bed and onto the floor. I cried out in surprise, and the next moment, pain spread throughout my body. Katong looked at me expressionlessly, and I struggled to get up, limping along with her out of the room. The restroom was far from the dormitory, and the road was quiet, so quiet that I could hear my heart pounding. Kitong kept squeezing my hand and it hurt, really hurt, but I dared not say anything. When we entered the restroom, I realized that the other girls from the dormitory were there, along with a few senior students pushing Xiaodan around. Xiaodan looked at me helplessly, whimpering with fear and grievance. Before I could react, one of the senior students came up and kicked me in the stomach. So you've learned to tattle, huh? I asked my little sister to take care of someone for me, but you had to show off, didn't you? Later, I found out that it was just because Xiaodan accidentally bumped into this senior student in the cafeteria, and some oil stains got on her uniform. She then asked Katong to teach Xiaodan a lesson. I fell to the ground, clutching my stomach and crying, I didn't. I didn't tell on anyone. The senior student squatted down and grabbed the collar of my shirt, tearing off a button, revealing the pink bra underneath. I reached out to cover myself, but Katung grabbed my hair from behind, causing me so much pain that I didn't know where to put my hands. Come help! Katung called out to the other roommates. They ran over, holding down my arms and legs, laughing and joking as if it were all a game. With her hands free, Katung took out her phone and started recording me. Come on, Wen Chi, look at the camera. Unable to move, I could only plead tearfully, please, don't. The senior student pulled at my clothes. Oh, wearing pink, are you trying to seduce men? The others burst into laughter, the raucous mockery echoing in the restroom. Katong approached me, excitedly holding the camera to my face. Sis, let's strip off her underwear and throw it in the men's restroom. Since she wants to seduce men, let's fulfill her wish. My body went cold with dread, but the senior student wasted no time. At the moment her hand touched my skin, a surge of energy seemed to explode within me. I writhed and struggled, kicking wildly, screaming, No! Let me go! Go cover her mouth, Katong ordered Xiaodan, seeing no one else available. Xiaodan shook her head in fear, shrinking back. If you don't, I'll strip you naked and post a video of it on social media. Let's see how you handle that, Katong threatened. With no choice, Xiaodan did as she was told. She knelt beside me, not covering my mouth with her hand, but instead holding her arm across my mouth for me to bite. I lost control, like a lamb about to be slaughtered, struggling with all my might in my final moments. Though I knew there was no escape, every part of my body fought back. I didn't know how hard I bit, but the taste of blood filled my mouth. She cried as she apologized to me, tears falling onto my face and into my heart. A chill spread through my chest and suddenly, the struggle ceased. Ah, the slaughter was over, and in that moment, I wished only for death. 
They threw my underwear into the men's restroom, where there were many boys secretly smoking. So there was a burst of cheers, laughter, and even whistling from next door. Even people on our side were chatting with the boys in the men's restroom over the wall. They were so happy, and I was just the clown they were enjoying at the moment. Katong stopped recording, squatting down to pat my face. This is what happens when you tattle. Keep a low profile in the future, or I'll let the whole school enjoy the show, she said, shaking her phone in front of me, then letting them release me and walking out of the restroom, stepping over my body. Xiao Dun knelt beside me, apologizing over and over again. I pulled my clothes back up, curling into a ball and burying my head in my knees. It was as if I had lost the ability to cry. In this moment, I didn't know how to describe my emotions. It seemed like I didn't even dare to hate them in my heart. I just wanted to die. But I didn't dare. I hadn't seen my parents yet. They said they would come back to accompany me for the college entrance exam after finishing their work this year. I hadn't seen my brother yet. He said he earned money from part-time work and wanted to prepare a huge 18th birthday gift for me. Almost, it was almost here. Just one month until my birthday. Just wait a little longer, until my backer returns, until I see them, then I'll tell them about all the grievances I've suffered. I became more and more sensitive and withdrawn, feeling like people were laughing at me even when walking through the campus. As time passed, I learned to stay out of Katong's sight, hoping to avoid beatings. And it worked because they found that it was more fun to beat up Xiaodan than me. I was timid, introverted, short, and thin, easily pushed over as if I were born to be bullied. But once bullying started on someone, it would continue. Kitong stopped hitting me, but she didn't plan to let me off that easily. Every lunchtime, I would deliberately go to the cafeteria 20 minutes before the break bell, because by then Kitong and her group would have finished eating. There weren't many people in the cafeteria then, so I could eat without fear. That day, Katong and her friends didn't know why they hadn't left yet, but I didn't pay attention. I just wanted to finish eating and leave as soon as possible. They sat down beside me with their bowls, not saying a word. My hands started shaking. Katong looked at my bowl and said, Hey, what are you eating? Just this little? Let me add some dishes for you, Chi Chi. I reached out to take back my bowl and whispered, No, it's okay. Katong fiercely hit my hand with chopsticks, it hurt a lot, and I instinctively pulled my hand back. Then I watched Katong spit into my food. I thought she just didn't want me to eat, but she made me swallow it. Eat up, Chi Chi, it's my treat, Katong said as other roommates started cheering. Seeing me still hesitant, Katong slapped me on the head. You don't want to give face, huh? Do you believe I'll post your video on my social media right now? The cafeteria lady peeked out from the serving window and shouted, What are you doing? Stop bullying your classmates. Katong picked up her chopsticks and threw them hard towards the window where the cafeteria lady was. The plastic chopsticks hit the tiles and broke into pieces. Don't interfere, damn it. Watch out, I'll have my dad fire you tomorrow. The cafeteria lady silently closed the window, and there was no one left to help me. Watching me swallow the food, Katong finally seemed satisfied and placed their bowls in front of me. As a thank you for adding extra dishes, you can wash all these bowls, she said. Once they left, I rushed to the sink and threw up. It was strange. This time I didn't cry. Had I accepted it? I thought they were just trying to establish dominance by fighting at school, but I never expected it to be this malicious. Xiao Dan couldn't take it anymore and walked into the principal's office one afternoon. The principal called Katong's father and gathered everyone from our dorm. Katong's father sat on the couch, crossing his legs arrogantly. He didn't seem like the parent of a bully at all. He proudly told the principal, I know my daughter. If others don't provoke her, how could she bully them? The principal, standing nearby, nodded slightly in agreement, then turned to Xiao Dan. Why don't you think about your own reasons? Are you completely innocent? The principal said. 
Xiao Dan swayed, seeming like she couldn't understand what the principal was saying. Ke Tong's father didn't even look at Xiao Dan properly. After finishing a cigarette, he left. Passing by Ke Tong, he said, You don't have to fight. If you hurt someone, you'll have to pay. This series of dramatic events made me see the world in a new light. The principal symbolically said that bullying classmates wasn't allowed and then let us leave. Later, because I was afraid of getting beaten up, I would still choose to sit on my chair, even if they poured red ink on it. Even when I felt Katong putting glue on my ponytail, I pretended not to know. But Xiao Dan still dropped out because she reported it to the principal, and Katong got scolded by her father. So, on a Friday afternoon, they dragged Xiao Dan into an abandoned old house and used an iron spoon handle to hurt her. Xiao Dan's mother cried and cursed the school leaders at the school gate and even went to the police station to report the incident. I thought if the police arrested Katong, I wouldn't get beaten up anymore. Katong was indeed taken away by the police, but soon I saw the police car coming back to the school gate, bringing her back. With no evidence, only Xiao Dan's testimony, it was impossible to punish these people. From the second floor classroom corridor, I looked down and saw Xiao Dan's mother sitting at the entrance with tears and snot streaming down her face, suddenly feeling a sourness in my nose. If my mom found out that I was being bullied, would she react like this too? Then I hope she never finds out, because Xiao Dan's mother's grief is too heartbreaking. The reality proved that I was still too naive. I heard Xiao Dan's mother pointing at Katong's father and cursing, saying Xiao Dan lost her innocence and would be considered unchaste by her future in-laws, and she would receive less dowry. I took a sharp breath, feeling sorrow for Xiao Dan. Her mother wasn't worried about the harm she suffered, only concerned that Xiao Dan wouldn't receive more dowry in the future. Later, Xiao Dan told me she was going to work in Guangdong. Her mother found her a factory job where she could earn 3,000 yuan a month. I cautiously asked her if Katong had apologized to her. She smiled awkwardly and said, Is giving money considered an apology? Her dad compensated my mom 20,000 yuan, and my mom never mentioned it again. I can go to high school because my mom thinks having a high school diploma means we can ask for more dowry in the future. She said, Chi Chi, you will definitely get into college. After this incident, Katong restrained herself a bit and didn't bother me for a long time. I also relaxed a bit and dared to go directly to eat lunch during noon break. On the weekend, while I was writing in my diary at home, Katong sent me a message asking me to come to her house for her birthday party at night. Although she hadn't bullied me lately, I still felt uneasy. Besides, our relationship wasn't good enough to celebrate birthdays together, so I refused, saying my parents didn't allow me to go out. Katong started to threaten me with a video. If I ask you to come, you should come. Don't talk nonsense. Just come and help me clean up, and then you can go back. Otherwise, I'll post the video on social media. When I saw the word video, I panicked and had no choice but to agree to her request. As I ran out of the house, Grandma asked where I was going, and I had to tell her I was going to school. I got on my bike, ready to rush to Kaitong's house, when I received a friend request on my phone, with the note Jiao. I didn't understand why he wanted to add me, but I had more important things to do now. But the phone kept ringing, so I had to stop the bike. Jiao and Kaitong were already good friends, and I couldn't take any chances, so I accepted his request. Before I could even type a word, he sent me two pictures. I clicked to open them, and it was Kaitong posting my video in a group chat, with people making vulgar comments below. My whole body froze in shock. Didn't I agree to go already? Why did she still post it? With trembling hands, I swiped to the next picture, where someone in the group suggested Kaitong invite me out. Kaitong said the person should give her 300 bucks, and she'd arrange it. Another person chimed in saying they'd offer 200. Ji Yao sent another message, don't come, there are a lot of guys at her house. My legs turned to jelly, and I collapsed on the ground. I'm done. My life is ruined. 
My body felt cold all over, my back and palms were sweaty, my heart felt dead inside, and I couldn't even shed a tear. Thinking carefully, what did I do wrong in the past three months since school started? Just because I'm ugly, because I don't know how to beg for mercy, because I glanced at her too much, does that mean I deserve to be bullied? I couldn't imagine what people I knew would say when they saw my video. It's as if they were right in front of me, pointing and laughing, mocking me. Kaitong came over, pulled at my clothes, and said to them, See, I told you she's slutty. I instinctively hugged my arms tight, but realized it was just my imagination. I was still standing in the same place. But at this moment, I just wanted to die. It's too much to bear. Whether I closed or opened my eyes, all I saw was Kaitong bullying me, and I was about to collapse. Standing on the rooftop, the cold wind woke me up. I looked down and every plant and tree below was a bystander to Kaitong's bullying. In the dormitory building across, a window was lit. I saw Kaitong slap a girl hard, but I couldn't see her face. Looking further, Kaitong dragged a girl into the bathroom, ripped her clothes off, and recorded her naked body on her phone. I couldn't see her face either. Further away, Kaitong dragged a girl by her hair into a room. The girl's legs left a trail of blood on the gravel road as she cried and begged for mercy, but Kaitong ignored her. This time, I saw clearly. It was Xiaodan. I couldn't look anymore, so I closed my eyes, but the daylight blinded me. Oh, it's daytime now. I'm wide awake. Chi Chi. I turned around, it was my brother. No, it's not. Chi Chi. It's mom's voice. It felt like someone pushed me, and I fell from the rooftop. I opened my eyes suddenly and found myself in the hospital, with mom anxiously looking at me. Chi Chi, it's okay, mom's here, don't be afraid. So it was just a long dream, reliving Kaitong's bullying. It's been over 10 years already, and I don't have to endure being beaten anymore. There were arguments between dad and my brother outside the ward. Did my brother come to apologize? Wen Shu. I sent you to study law for postgraduate to get revenge for your sister, not for you to bring the abuser home to continue bullying your sister. My brother was angry too. Jia Jia's dad could arrange for me to enter a state-owned enterprise, so I could put in less effort for a few years. What can Chi Chi do for me? Why? I threw off the blanket, ran barefoot to open the door, and asked my brother outside. Why? Why should I forgive her just because she apologized? Besides, she hasn't apologized. Why should she be able to start anew with a new name while I have to live forever in past pain? I accused him desperately. Wen Shu. My brother and dad suddenly disappeared, and in front of me was mom. But I just came out a few minutes ago, why does she have so many white hairs on her head, and why did her figure become so short? Wen Shu. Mom shook my shoulder. Mom, what are you talking about? I'm Chi Chi, Chi Chi. Where did my brother go? Where's dad? Why are they all gone? I looked around but the empty hospital corridor was devoid of their figures. Mom held my shoulders tightly, tears streaming down her face. Wen Shuo, mom is begging you, please wake up, okay? Please. When did this happen? My mom is still joking with me. I shook my head in disbelief, mom, what are you talking about? I'm Chi Chi, Chi Chi, Wen, Chi Chi. I told my mom seriously, my hand instinctively reaching to fix my hair, but instead of touching it, I brushed against the stubble on my chin. I touched my chin in shock, I had a beard. A lot. A lot of beard. A sudden wave of fear washed over me, and I hastily ran into the hospital room, diving under the covers. Curling up, I muttered. I have a beard again, they're going to bully me again, they'll push me into the men's restroom, I don't want a beard, I don't want a beard, I don't want. I grabbed my face forcefully, trying to pull out all the hair. The covers were abruptly pulled off, and I hugged my head in fear. I'm having an episode again. I sat in the psychotherapy room. The doctor sat across from me, quickly jotting down notes in a book. Can you tell me about it? 
I leaned back in the chair, staring at the white ceiling above. I had a long dream, in which I was Chi-Chi when she grew up, and on Christmas Day, I watched my brother propose to the girl who used to bully me in school. I heard the sound of a pen being placed on the notebook, feeling a bit tired, I closed my eyes wearily. My brother urged me to be generous, not to dwell on the past. He said Jia Jia's dad could help his career, while I couldn't do anything useful. I went back to the first day when Kaitong bullied me, reliving the torment for three whole months. I went through it all over again. By this point, my voice was weary. The doctor remained silent for a long time before speaking, was there anything different? I opened my eyes, yes, in the dream, there was someone named Ji Yao who stopped the final bullying. The doctor sighed. You feel guilty because you couldn't save Chi Chi in time, so you blame yourself, creating fantasies where you propose to the bully and portray yourself as a bad brother. Tears were already streaming down my face, and I pounded my head in anguish. If only I had been a little earlier, I could have saved her, it's my fault, all my fault, for not going back sooner. The doctor tried to calm my emotions, urging me to think about where the real Kaitong was. In jail. In an urn. She should forever kneel before Chi Chi and repent. There was never a Jia Jia, only Kaitong. Could you give me Chi Chi's diary? Your episodes are becoming more frequent and lasting longer. You shouldn't keep reading her diary. This is the eighth time in ten years that you've imagined yourself as Chi Chi. I believe Chi Chi would want you to be okay. Look at how much your mom has aged. The doctor slowly drew back a curtain, letting more light into the room. I covered my face and wept, tears wetting my palms. So I haven't done anything wrong to Chi Chi, have I? I'm not a bad brother, am I? The doctor said gently. No, you're not. You're a good brother. You put the people who bullied Chi Chi in jail. You avenged her. After regaining my composure, my mother and I returned home. Behind us, the doctor's assistant entered the consultation room. What's wrong with him? He looks quite handsome. He has severe delusional disorder. His younger sister committed suicide in front of him and since then, he's been reading her diary and suicide note. Unable to cope with the trauma, he started to imagine himself as his sister. From the perspective of the brother. In reality, Ji Yao didn't stop the final bullying. He didn't add Chi Chi as a friend. Chi Chi only found out what they were going to do when she arrived at Kaiting's house, and those scumbags didn't spare her. I also didn't save Chi Chi. When I arrived at the school, she had already jumped from the rooftop and died in front of me. My parents rushed back, but they couldn't see Chi Chi one last time because her final state was too difficult to accept. I stopped them from going to see her, hoping they'd only remember Chi Chi at her most beautiful. I'd seen that scene alone, and it was enough. After reading Chi Chi's diary, it's really hard to imagine how much she was hurt, how desperate and painful it must have been for her. The bully's father was a powerful and wealthy man in the town, attempting to settle the matter privately with 200,000 yuan. That was a human life. I'll give you 200,000 yuan, can you kill your daughter? The father cursed loudly at his door, but the family just closed the door and turned on the TV, the sound of laughter mingling with the father's sobs, how ironic. My mother fell seriously ill, and I stayed at home to take care of her, afraid she'd do something foolish in her grief. My father spent his days shuttling between the court and the prosecutor's office, demanding justice for Kaitong. But the result of the lawsuit was that Chi Chi's death was ruled a suicide, and Kaitong didn't constitute a criminal offense. None of Chi Chi's old injuries in the autopsy report were considered serious enough to be prosecuted for intentional harm. And we couldn't find the videos the diary mentioned, so we really had no way to proceed. We couldn't accept it, whether to persist in appealing or to get the same result. My father heard that petitioning could get attention, so he went door to door with materials. We didn't get a clear result, but it caught the attention of the bully's father. He found my dad and offered to add another hundred thousand, but my dad refused. He asked my dad what he wanted, and my dad said, 
I want your daughter in jail. A few days later, my dad got into a car accident, which was undoubtedly another blow to our family. My mom aged significantly in an instant, sometimes murmuring to me, your sister's gone, your dad's gone, maybe we should leave too. The driver who caused the accident was clearly made a scapegoat. His reasons were unclear, his statements kept changing, but he still got sentenced. So I took over my dad's appeals, added more documents, a petition of over 500 pages, and my mom, becoming my only hope to keep going. In the third year, two people claiming to be classmates of Chi Chi found me and provided some evidence, including two crucial pictures and an agreement. The pictures were screenshots of videos posted by Kao Tong in a group and records of Chi Chi being sold to gangsters. The agreement was the settlement signed between little Dan's mom and Kao Tong's father. Zhuo Yao said he had been tormented for years, feeling responsible for what happened to Chi Chi. If he had told Chi Chi the truth from the beginning and prevented her from going to Kao Tong's house, none of this would have happened. If I needed, he was willing to testify. So I continued to appeal, demanding a retrial of Chi Chi's case, and finally, in the fifth year, the final outcome was confirmed. Kao Tong, relying on her father, continued to commit crimes after graduation, and I found evidence of many of her wrongdoings, one after another. Kao Tong was sentenced to 20 years for multiple crimes, and her father, whose business dealings were also shady, received a life sentence when all his crimes were combined. Even at the very end, Kao Tong still claimed it was just her being young and foolish, and never apologized to Chi Chi. Later, I heard that she died of a sudden illness in the third year of her sentence, perhaps it was karma. Bullies never deserve forgiveness. I fluctuated between moments of clarity and confusion. My mental state was not good. During the ghost festival, when I went to visit Chi Chi and dad with my mom, a beautiful butterfly rested on my nose for a long, long time.